Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Amanda Ryman, and I am from the University of California at Berkeley. I also work for an organization called the Drug Policy Alliance. We are an international nonprofit organization that works to reform drug policies, focusing on three main areas, harm reduction, cannabis policy reform, and the reform of mass incarceration related to the war on drugs. My previous life, before I worked in policy, I was a medical cannabis researcher in public health. And I conducted one of the very first studies of medical cannabis patients in dispensaries in California. So today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about medical cannabis in the United States and how it's different depending on where you are in the States. I also wanna clarify for people here about what you can and cannot do about obtaining cannabis in the United States. I wanna talk a little bit about who medical cannabis patients are and a phenomenon that we have seen happen in the United States and elsewhere where patients are consciously choosing to use cannabis, not just as a substitute for other prescription drugs, but as a substitute for alcohol and the hazardous use of other illicit drugs. So I'll talk about that as well. And then finally, I want to speak a bit about the role of medical cannabis under the big canopy of complementary and alternative health. We've been talking a lot about how do you think about how into a pharmaceutical model? And we haven't come up with a lot of answers. And I think that's because that is not where it belongs. It does not belong in a pharmaceutical model because it is not a pharmaceutical product. It is a botanical product which holds in and of itself some very unique properties that we might lose if we force it down a policy path of other pharmaceuticals. So let's look a little bit about how medical cannabis started in the United States. So I live in California. We have had a medical cannabis law in California since 1996. So almost 18 years. So how did this happen? It really was born out of the HIV AIDS crisis in California and in San Francisco in the late 1980s. So before we knew about how people contracted HIV. There was a lot of misunderstanding. People thought you could get it from hugging someone or from sharing uh, water or a washcloth or from giving them a kiss on the cheek. And because of that, most HIV patients were socially isolated. No one wanted to touch them, not even doctors. Their own family members were told, don't touch them, you might get HIV. So there was a lot of depression and social isolation among this population. What they found was that cannabis was very helpful for the symptoms they were experiencing related to their HIV. It gave them an appetite, it helped with a nausea, it helped them sleep, and it got them together with other HIV patients to give each other social support. The very first medical cannabis dispensary were groups of HIV patients in San Francisco who would go to somebody's house and get a bunch of cannabis and use it together. So the very first medical marijuana law in the country was Proposition P, which was passed in 1992. All it said was that if you're using cannabis for a medical purpose, we'll leave you alone. That's all it said. And actually, 18 years later, that's pretty much all our law in California says right now. We had our state law passed in 1996, which was Proposition 215. And now, almost 18 years later, 21 US states, plus the District of Columbia, Washington, DC, have uh, medical marijuana laws. And it is being considered in at least three more states. And not just the liberal states anymore. We used to hear California, of course, you know, uh, Colorado, of course. Uh, those are very liberal places, but now they're thinking about it in Florida, Louisiana, 
Georgia, Kentucky, states that are traditionally extremely conservative. And the reason, which I'll go into a little bit, is because of the high CVB medication. The impact that children using this medicine have had on legislators and people in those states is extremely dramatic. And it's bringing the conversation alive in places that never would have thought about medical cannabis previously. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more detail about the program in California. So in California, when you ask what conditions can someone use medical cannabis for, the answer is yes, or all of them, or any condition for which your doctor says, this might be good for you. So in California, we have a law that allows anybody to obtain medical cannabis with the recommendation of their doctor. We are the only state besides the state of Massachusetts that has that rule. In all the other states, there is a very specific list of conditions for which you can obtain medical cannabis. The reason we left it so open was because in 1996, we were just starting to see the research come in on medical cannabis. We had just discovered that we had an endocannabinoid system not too much before we passed this law in California. So there was a concern that if we left something off, we would learn two, three, four years later that it was really good for that condition and then people couldn't access it. So we didn't want to cut off access to someone who may really need it. The most common reasons for using cannabis in California are really the most common reasons that people use prescription medications in the United States, which are chronic pain, insomnia, and anxiety. Now, because in California you can get it for any condition, you can get it for both physical and mental health conditions. This is very rare. Most states in the United States, you cannot get cannabis for a mental health related condition. The one condition that's really started to turn that around is post-traumatic stress disorder. We have seen great evidence out of Israel for the use of cannabis for post-traumatic stress disorder, but it is still only on the list in very few states in the United States because there is this big concern still of reefer madness, that marijuana will make you go crazy. And so they're very conservative with the idea of giving it to somebody who has a mental health issue. But what we have seen is that most patients who have a physical health issue are also dealing with some kind of mental health symptom associated with that condition. So it could be that you have chronic pain and also insomnia, because who can sleep when they're in pain? Or you have cancer and depression. And so instead of prescribing two or three or four different medications, patients can just use cannabis and address both mental health and physical health conditions. So what are the benefits and risks to being a medical cannabis patient in the United States? Well, the benefits are that in your state, I want to make this very clear, in your state, you have legal protection. You do not have that protection once you leave your state. So I have protection in the state of California as a medical cannabis patient. If I go to Michigan, which also has medical cannabis, they do not recognize my patient status. So I am not legal to have cannabis in the state of Michigan. I am legal to have it in the state of California. Cannabis, including THC and CBD, is a Schedule I substance in the United States, which means if you take it outside of that state, you are subject to federal drug smuggling crimes. Even if you have permission to obtain it, it is illegal to take it out of the state. And it is very illegal to take it out of the country. So people in the United States have to use the cannabis in their own state. They cannot take it across state lines. 
Another benefit is that you have access to safe medicine. So you're not buying it on the street. You're buying it from pl a place that is testing it, making sure it is not contaminated. You have access to a variety of medicines. There are some dispensaries in California that have 20, 30 different strains of cannabis at any one time. So you have low, medium, high THC, high, medium, low CBD. You have a wide variety of products, not just the flowers and the edibles, but you have tinctures and you have topical lotions, which I'll talk about in a minute. You also have access to additional services. So something that was so fascinating when I first started studying dispensaries back in about 2005 is that a lot of them weren't just about the marijuana. They were holistic health centers. They offered massage, acupuncture, counseling, referrals, uh, entertainment like bingo and live music, things to help the whole health of the individual. Not just you walk in, here are your pills, goodbye, good luck. But how are you doing today? Do you want to come and stay for an art class? And then we're going to have tea. There was one dispensary in San Francisco that actually had doggy daycare. So if you had a hospital appointment and you couldn't take your dog, you could leave your dog at the dispensary and they would watch it until you came back. So this is something that was way beyond just giving people marijuana. It was part of this holistic and alternative health movement that was happening. Um, and then the risks, of course, as I mentioned, federal law in the United States does not recognize medical marijuana. You want to talk about being a hypocrite. According to the federal government in the US, there are no medical purposes for marijuana. But the federal government has a patent on CBD as a neuroprotectant, admitting it has properties to protect the brain out of one side of their mouth, out of the other side, but there's no medical benefits to the plant of marijuana. So we have no federal medical marijuana program, which is why I say once you leave the state that you are authorized to use in, you are now subject to arrest. It also can impact your ability to get federal benefits such as public housing, uh, federal jobs. There are families who are having their children taken away because they are medical cannabis patients, even in states where that is allowed, because the federal government that employs those agencies does not recognize that cannabis is a medicine. And then your local police, sometimes they're very nice, and they say, oh, you're a patient, OK, OK. Sometimes they say, I don't care. Marijuana is illegal under federal law, and I'm going to take it from you anyway. So you really don't know, even where you're in your own state, how you're going to be treated. So as I mentioned, currently 21 states plus DC have laws for medical cannabis. Two states, Colorado and Washington, allow for anyone 21 and over to access cannabis. Each law is slightly different. So how much you can possess, what the penalties are, how the system works is different in each state. The federal government does not recognize this value. CBD-rich medicine has really taken off as a treatment for childhood conditions. In the US now, we have public support for full legalization at over 50%. Um, medical schools are still very resistant to teaching about this, about the endocannabinoid system. Medical cannabis research is rarely funded. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the United States holds a monopoly over the marijuana for research. This organization, NIDA, funds 80% of the world's research on drugs. The only place you can get marijuana in the United States to study is from them. They will not give it to you unless you tell them you are looking for something harmful. This really gets in the way of conducting research. So where does that leave patients? Well, these are real people 
They have real needs, and they are caught in this political game. The restrictions on what condition you can obtain cannabis is based on fear. It's not at all based on science. Um, there's an assumption that very few patients are real, that they are just looking for an excuse to get intoxicated. And part of this is because, and this has been mentioned earlier today, there's a stigma that lumps with people that use cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin, when really they're more like people that use echinacea, St. John's wort, other herbal remedies, rather than illicit substances. So the bottom line is that medical cannabis consumers are more like consumers of acupuncture than consumers of cocaine. So now I'm gonna present some data, we love science, um, on medical cannabis patients and who they are. So this sample came from 350 patients at a medical cannabis dispensary in Berkeley, California. So here's a little bit of their demographics. There's an assumption that medical cannabis patients are all 18-year-old white men. That is not true. The majority are white, and I think that part of this is because there is a lot of racial disparity around marijuana arrests in the United States. People of color are way more likely to be arrested, so sometimes they keep their substance use uh, underground because they're afraid. Uh, one thing we do see is a higher than average uh, percentage of Native Americans, uh, and this is hold, held true in all of our samples, and I think this again goes back to beliefs about plants as medicines and how certain cultures are less inclined to go the pharmaceutical drug route than to go to traditional methods of medicine. Um, the average age is 40 years old. Um, we have found this in uh, sample after sample. And then the youngest, 18, and the oldest, 81. So one other thing I'll mention about dispensaries is that they're the only places I have ever seen, ever, where 18-year-olds socialize with 81-year-olds, unless someone is making them. So I think there's a lot of social capital that can be gained by giving people an environment to use cannabis together, because you don't see that interaction otherwise. You don't see that. Um, so these are more of the demographics. You can see that almost 3 quarters of them have health insurance. But health insurance does not cover medical cannabis, which means they are foregoing cheaper drugs that they could get through insurance to excess cannabis, which they cannot get through insurance, which shows that they are determined to use the cannabis. 81% have at least some college education. So this is a very educated group of people. Um, and most people visit the dispensary at least a couple times a month or more. When we look at their patterns of use, we see about 50% say that they use cannabis two to three times a day. So these are individuals that are using regularly throughout the day. Most use about three to eight grams per week. So 28 grams is an ounce. So about an eighth to a quarter ounce a week is what they report using. And most say that they've had no change in their cannabis use after over six months. So their, their use rate is stable. They're not finding they need to use more and more and more, uh, like we see with some opiates, uh, where tolerance happens very, very quickly. In terms of the types of products that they like to use, flowers are still number one, uh, followed by edibles and concentrates. But something I want to mention is we're seeing an increased interest in the use of topicals. So topicals for muscle pain that you rub on and then it makes it numb, that's what it does. So it's very, very good for older adults who have a lot of joint pain and inflammation but do not want the psychoactive effect and do not want to smoke. Uh, is very, very helpful. 
Uh, in terms of how people ingest cannabis, smoking is still the most common, but vaporizing is catching up. And with the development of the vapor pens that look like the e-electronic cigarettes, more patients are using vaporization, which is good because it reduces the harms. Yeah, he's got one right there. Yay! <laughs> so these you can use anywhere. Uh, just a, about myself, I have arthritis in my feet, and I like to go to Disneyland. And in Disneyland, you walk for seven hours in a row. And I can't do that with my arthritis. But if I have the pen, I can do it. Because I can use the pen at Disneyland. Yes. So it has been so great for patients who need to use during the day to keep up that relief. Uh, eating and then rubbing on the skin, again, is, is getting more popular. When we look at patients' overall health, we see that about 70% of the patients say they have a chronic medical condition. So this isn't a, I got in a car accident and hurt my leg, but it will get better in about six weeks. This is, I have a condition that I have to manage every day for the rest of my life. So when we think about the idea of taking a pharmaceutical drug every day for the rest of our lives, we have to really think, what is that going to do to us after taking it every day? What's that do to our liver? What does that do to our other organs? We see the impact of using a lot of ibuprofen over the years. So people are concerned if they have these chronic conditions, what pharmaceutical drugs will do to them. About 60% of patients um, use other medical treatments in addition to cannabis. So it's not just cannabis. It's cannabis plus physical therapy. It's cannabis plus chemotherapy. It's cannabis plus something else. And of those people that do multiple treatments, 85% of them said cannabis has less unwanted side effects than those other treatments. And 88% said that cannabis made their symptoms much better compared to those other treatments. So it's not that necessarily cannabis is the only thing they use, but when used with other treatments, it's a far superior type of intervention. About half of the patients are using for pain. And this is not uncommon. When we look at why people are using opiates or other pharmaceutical drugs, a great deal of them are using for chronic pain. 13% specifically for arthritis and 11% specifically for headaches or migraines. We've seen some good research come out recently on the impact of cannabinoids on migraines and cluster headaches. As I mentioned, 75% are using for some kind of mental health condition. And this could be related to a physical health condition that they have, or it could be a standalone condition, like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. Other conditions mentioned were things like appetite stimulation, asthma, carpal tunnel syndrome is becoming more common because more people working on computers all day are having severe carpal tunnel syndrome. And then cancer, MS, PMS, IBS, um, and nausea. So again, California, a wide variety of conditions for which people can use. When we look at their use of other drugs, um, it's, very similar to, it's very similar to what we see in the country as a whole. So about half currently drink alcohol. This is very similar to the national average in the US. Uh, it's higher than average. The tobacco use rate is 25%, which is higher than the national average in the US. And 11% have used a non-prescribed, non-over-the-counter drug in the past 30 days, which is also a bit higher than the national average. But we're also talking about a sampling bias because we're asking people who are already seeking out alternatives to what they're using, and they're more likely to do that in other areas of their life as well. So individuals that are more likely to put down the Vicodin and pick up cannabis also may be more willing to try MDMA for depression rather than some other pharmaceutical drug. So I've talked about this a little bit before, uh, but just the physical health and mental health connection, that a lot of physical health conditions have a mental health component, and so cannabis is able to treat both of those uh, issues. 
Now, one thing I wanted to get into a little bit deeper and what my research focused on kind of after I was gathering information, I found that a lot of patients were talking about this idea of substitution. This idea of I was having a problem with X substance, so I'm using cannabis instead. And so we asked people about this idea of substitution and that we found about half of them said they'd used it as a substitute for alcohol, about 25% had used as a substitute for an illicit substance, and about 66% as a substitute for prescription drugs. Uh, this outcome was then replicated with an additional 400 patients in Canada, and we found the same thing, um, that patients are substituting, that they are making this conscious choice to use cannabis instead of another substance that's caused them problems in their lives. Uh, the most common reasons why people are substituting, well, less adverse side effects is huge. I mean, the side effects associated with opiates are just horrific. So, you know, looking at cannabis as something with fewer negative side effects. Uh, better symptom management, so actually having it work better than their other substance. And then the third most common reason was less withdrawal potential. So, you know, you have individuals that were put on opiates, and then when they tried to stop the opiates, had withdrawals. And so the next time they were put on opiates, they said, whoa, 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 I don't want to do that again. It was too difficult to get off of them. Let me try something else. So when we talk about substitution, what we're really talking about is a conscious or unconscious choice to use one drug instead of another. The first substitution study was actually done back in 1970 by a psychiatrist named Todd Micaria. It was an N equals one study or a case study where he gave a female alcoholic antabuse and cannabis and found that she was able to stop drinking and that the negative outcomes associated with alcohol in her life started to be reduced. And so he thought, well, she's doing much better on cannabis than she was doing on alcohol. So why might someone substitute? Uh, well, safety. I mean, when we look at the potential fatal overdose with cannabis compared to a fatal overdose from even alcohol, right? The safety profile of cannabis is definitely greater. Uh, level of addiction potential. So individuals not wanting to get dependent on other substances. Uh, the effectiveness in relieving symptoms. Access is a big one as well. Uh, in the United States, because we have such an issue with prescription drug overdose, they've really restricted access to opiates, where there's almost a shortage in some areas of opiates. Doctors are very careful about prescribing because they're being monitored. So sometimes it's easier to access cannabis. And then the level of acceptance. It's more acceptable to use cannabis than it is to use heroin in the United States. So individuals might substitute cannabis as a way of making themselves more socially acceptable. When we talk about the types of substitution, we're talking about really three different types, and cannabis works on all of these levels. So one is the, the one people are most familiar with, right? Psychoactive substitution. I usually have wine after work to wind down. I don't want to drink alcohol, so I'll use cannabis instead because it will have the same effect as the wine. Then we have to address and reduce cravings for other substances, um, which I'll talk about more in a minute and then to improve outcomes while reducing side effects. So looking at prescription drugs, trying to, to have a good outcome from using the drug with a less side effect. Now this second one is extremely interesting because when you think about the effects of cannabis, um, stimulating appetite, reducing nausea, helping with sleep, increasing mood, reducing muscle spasms. Gee, those all sound like withdrawal symptoms from opiates and alcohol. So people are realizing they can use cannabis to help with the withdrawal symptoms while they are getting off of something else so that they don't relapse. A lot of the reason that people relapse is because the withdrawals are so intense that they can't abstain anymore. But if cannabis can help ease those withdrawals, you can abstain for longer 
you can get through the withdrawals, and you're less likely to relapse. So under that hypothesis, it's possible that cannabis can be a treatment for people that are trying to reduce or stop their use of other substances. Um, so in California, it's a really interesting question to study because in California, you can get a medical cannabis recommendation for anything. So we have a population of people that use cannabis that look very much like the general population. And these are just some previous research studies looking at substitution. So a survey of 11 doctors in California, all of them said they had seen patients that were using marijuana as a substitute for alcohol. And one of them said that 90% of his patients reduced their alcohol use after beginning the use of medical marijuana. So it begs that question, are marijuana and alcohol complements or substitutes? And we're still trying to figure that out definitively. Another research study looked at 100 medical marijuana patients um, and found that half of them were using a drug besides marijuana. So this is kind of highlighting that among certain, and these were mostly HIV patients, among certain medical cannabis We are moving towards that end in a couple of ways. One is the American Herbal Products Association, which regulates all of the herbal products, nutritional supplements, um, anything that says on the bottle, these claims have not been confirmed by the FDA, that's what they regulate. And they have taken up medical cannabis. They have now developed guidelines for regulators on the cultivation, lab testing, manufacturing, and distribution of cannabis that brings it in line with how other herbal medicines are regulated in the United States. And they're very strict guidelines. It's not easy to grow medicinal grade cannabis, but it can be done. Another recent thing that happened is that the American Herbal Pharmacopeia, which is basically the big book of all the herbs in the United States that we say have medical value and has dosing guidelines and definitions, they just released one for cannabis. So cannabis is now in the big book that says that it is an herbal medicine in the United States. Now, it's still not recognized by the federal government as being a medicine, but within the circles of herbal medicine practitioners, it is starting to gain some traction. Now, 40% of the US public has tried complementary and alternative health treatments. So this is something that is definitely popular. So in uh, the study at Berkeley Patients Group, we asked patients if they had participated in any complementary and alternative medicine practices in the last six months, and 78 of them had. So we asked them what they were doing. So as you can see, almost six, over 62% of them are participating in meditation, almost half do yoga, um, massage, acupuncture, chiropractic work. These are all common practices among people that are also using medical cannabis. So again, it's not just about the cannabis, it's about looking at it in the context of alternative and complementary health. 
So something else we asked them is their beliefs about complementary and alternative health. So just as an example, the first question asks them uh, how much they believe that traditional medications like Vicodin and Xanax are their first choice in treating symptoms of illness. And one being do not believe and five completely believe, they're at a 1.51. So they're not too confident that this is where they would go first for Xanax and Vicodin. You can also see that even if the question herbalists possess better knowledge of the human system than traditional medical doctors, oh, over half, 3.23, completely believe that. So I think it's also the rejection of cannabis that they have seen from the more Western medicine doctors that has pushed them in this direction. I can't tell you how many patients I have talked to who say medical cannabis has completely changed my life. It has given me my life back, and when I told my physician that, they told me I needed to go to drug treatment. So that really hurts the trust that patients have in their physician. When they say, this is helping me, here's the science, here's the evidence, and then it's rejected. They find a lot more acceptance among naturopaths and holistic health practitioners. They say, yes, I, I understand why that would be helpful. And so people tend to gravitate towards those types of practitioners. So as I mentioned, it's possible that because patients are already using cannabis as a substitute, and because they already really buy in to ideas around complementary and alternative medicine, that there could be a way to introduce cannabis as a conduit to mindfulness, which could help reduce the likelihood of addiction. So the last thing I wanna mention before we open it up for questions is one small study that I did at a dispensary in San Francisco. Um, so this dispensary uh, serves the San Francisco population. They also do a lot with harm reduction. So we had this idea. They, oh, they also offer meditation for their patients. So they have a meditation group that meets twice a week. So we had this idea. What if you found some individuals that were medical cannabis patients that were also practicing harm reduction around some other substance in their life? And we introduced them with cannabis and then helped teach them how to meditate. Would this combination be successful in helping them reduce their use of that other substance? So we recruited um, eight methamphetamine users from San Francisco who were not trying to abstain, but were trying to stay within their own boundaries of methamphetamine use. And we wanted to know, is mindfulness practice and cannabis use associated with a reduction in craving for methamphetamine? So we kind of wanted to see if all of these things that patients had been telling us about substitution and how it was working, could we put it in a clinical situation and, and have it work? So we recruited patients from a local harm reduction center. They were all already medical cannabis patients and they were trying to stay within their boundaries of methamphetamine use. Uh, there were 10 patients, uh, two did not complete the study. Um, so just to quickly give you the results, uh, we did interviews with them, and I want to mention this because those that work in addictions uh, will understand this, and those who have been through addiction will understand this, um, that a lot of people that have addiction uh, issues describe this little voice in their head that even when they want to not use, the little voice tells them to use. And so they will say, I know I should not use today, and then the little voice will say, oh, you know you want to, it will feel so good, we could have it in 10 minutes. Oh, it will be so easy. And they give in to the voice, and then they feel very bad about themselves. What these patients told me was that when the little voice comes, when they use some cannabis, it quiets the voice enough where they're able to say, no, I'm just going to go to sleep. And then when they wake up the next day, they feel very good about themselves because they say, I was for forced to make this decision. I made the right decision and now I feel like I can do it again. And that cannabis helps facilitate that. Um, all of them had already started meditating. So we had individuals that say, oh, I know meditation is helpful. I just need some more tools to help me really maximize the benefits of it. So we gave them over six weeks, they participated in six meditation sessions. 
We gave them standardized assessments of mindfulness and craving at beginning and end of each meditation session over the six weeks. And we also had them record all of their alcohol and drug use over the six weeks. What we found is that overall, there was a reduction in craving and an increase in mindfulness among the group. And um, they all were meditating pretty much every day uh, when they were in the study. Um, and something that was really interesting was that even though they were using cannabis every day during the study, their number of drinking days and their number of days using methamphetamine stayed really low. So there's an assumption that if people start using cannabis, they're just gonna start using everything else again. And what this shows is that it's possible for people to use cannabis, even a large amount of cannabis, and still stay within their boundaries of other substances. So it's not leading them or causing them to relapse into other things. Um, so I'm just gonna go through there real quick. Um, so that was just some beautiful graphs, but we're going to get to questions. So, um, so some of the implications, as I mentioned, uh, participants were using cannabis regularly while still reducing their use of other things. Um, those who are already participating in harm reduction might really be open to this idea of mindfulness and the way of using cannabis to bring about this idea of mindfulness, and that cannabis might have the ability to quiet the addictive voice and help drug consumers stay within their desired boundaries of use. So in the United States, you know, we have a patchwork of medical marijuana policy. We have no federal recognition of the medical value of marijuana. So what is happening is that each individual state is taking it upon themselves to develop policies, to develop science, but they are doing it all while the federal government is doing this and making, trying to make sure that nothing ever comes up. So they're very much holding down the ability to investigate these questions further. Um, so I'm hoping that will change as more countries like Uruguay open up the potential for research in this area. So thank you very much, and I think we have time for questions. <laughs> Nós também abriremos para perguntas. Três perguntas. Rapidinho, olha só, já temos as três perguntas. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay, my name is Cassiano. I'm a um, really believer of uh, uh, the medical cannabis. And uh, my concern today is because Brazil, we have only one choice to import. And thanks God, we, we have Hemp Meds PX which is a, uh, uh, how you say, uh, hemp oil. And different from Colorado, which they had a web shower. And what's your view about hemp meds uh, as a medicine? And uh, because we only had this choice here. So I beg you, please be honest. And uh, you know, mothers from here, they really uh, want to know uh, if it's Good or not? I, th I think it's good because it's working, right? Um, so hemp is very nutritional and has a lot of benefits, just the hemp plant itself. And you can take a, enough hemp plants and extract CBD from that plant. That being said, there's no regulation on what they are making. There's nobody that's checking to make sure that what is in there is what they say is in there. I do not support the hemp-derived CBD. I do not think it is the same as the Charlotte's Web and the CBD that is being derived from the actual psychoactive cannabis plant. One of the reasons is that there is something called the entourage effect. All of the cannabinoids in the plant play a very important role in the efficacy of the plant. When you just take one cannabinoid and then no others, it really reduces the efficacy of that plant. So even the uh, Sativex, the uh, uh, Epidiolex, that is the CBD, has some THC, very small, but has some THC. That's what they say. Um, 
right now, CBD is a Schedule One drug in the United States, just like THC. It is just as illegal to import CBD as it is to import THC. It's just as illegal to travel from one country, to, from the United States outside with CBD, because it is also a Schedule One substance. I get concerned. I know there's a lot of families that really, really want access to CBD. I am concerned that companies are taking advantage of that um, because there's nothing in the United States that's forcing that to be examined and to say, no, this is this. So it's a buyer beware situation right now, unfortunately. We have no research to show that it's working. We have individuals that say it's working and we have other individuals that say it didn't work at all. We have no idea why because there's no research. So first we need to make sure that that is tested and that we know exactly what is in it. Then we need to do research to see you know, if it's actually working. It's not gonna be hurtful, but I can't stand behind its efficacy. Thank you. Um, a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, ben Wally from the University of Reading. Um, I'm gonna, I've got three things um, <laughs> which I will try to make as quick as possible. Uh, the first is a clarification. The full AHP monograph on cannabis isn't yet available, but the, um, ex the section on epilepsy is because I wrote it. Um, the third observation is uh, it does concern me uh, that you conflate cannabis with uh, complementary and alternative medicines because if you look at that list that you put cannabis with none of them have any evidence base valid evidence base whatsoever for efficacy um, cannabis I agree fully that for specific indications there is solid evidence for efficacy um, and I have great concerns as actually do a number of medical marijuana users in California that I spoke to in San Diego late last year about this if you like route down the, the complementary alternative medicine route. Um, and I'll finish with a question which leads on from that, if I may, which is that from the epilepsy point of view, uh, a recent survey of Californian medical marijuana dispensaries showed that approximately 40% of the cannabis sold had detectable traces of pesticides, many of them anticholinesterases. And anticholinesterases are a significant risk, particularly for people with epilepsy, as they raise central nervous system excitability. How would you, with the model that you've described, um, go about maintaining safety for patients with life-threatening illnesses if this, if you like, complementary alternative herbal route was approached? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the issues with the fact there isn't mandatory testing right now. Now, they're starting to implement it in some states. New Mexico, for example, has just released their guidelines for mandatory testing that are in line with the uh, Herbal Products Association's recommended uh, guidelines in terms of, of how much is allowable, which is basically nothing. So this is, and it's, it, there are a lot of people that don't want these guidelines to come down because of what you're saying, because right now so much of it is failing. You know, luckily we haven't had any big outbreaks of health conditions related to that, but as more people seek out cannabis as a treatment, we need to ensure that what they're getting is safe. And one of the big issues with the federal government dragging its feet on regulations is that they're leaving each state, and in sometimes each county, um, the task of this regulation, which they're not equipped to take on by any sense of the imagination. So it's a learning curve, but I think that's the next step. Is, and we're seeing that now in Colorado with mandatory testing, um, and we're gonna see it in other states starting soon as well, and I think people are going to have to adjust their cultivation practices because they're gonna have to realize that with legitimacy comes regulation, and you can't have one without the other and still deliver a safe product. Eu vou pedir que alguém traduza para ela. É. É, eu tenho um filho que teve surtos psicóticos é, decorrentes do uso de maconha. E ele hoje é, frequenta os narcóticos anônimos. É, é, e desde então ele não precisa usar nenhuma medicação para antipsicótico ou coisa assim. Né? Inclusive, os diagnósticos que tinham sido dados antes, como esquizofrenia, transtorno bipolar, coisa assim, foram todos afastados pela psiquiatra. 
E existem psiquiatras no Brasil. E mesmo no, no exterior, eu vi que eu, eu li em algum lugar que em, na Holanda tinha tido mais surtos é, de esquizofrenia ou coisa assim, por causa da, do uso de, de maconha. Aqui no Brasil tem um médico que é bem opositor da liberação da maconha, falando que poderia haver assim, um, um, uma quantidade maior de pessoas com surtos psicóticos, que, que seria como se fosse um, um, uma forma de uma doença que está assim, escondida se manifestar. E aí, como eu vi você falar sobre a maconha e a saúde mental, eu queria que você falasse também sobre esse aspecto. Porque eu, pessoalmente, não acreditava nisso até que aconteceu com meu filho. E, para mim, foi uma grande surpresa, que eu pensava que isso era história para mentiroso, sabe? E, quando eu vi isso acontecer com meu filho, inclusive, ele demorou muito para sair do surto psicótico. Eu fiquei com medo até dele não voltar. Mas foi uma, uma, uma semente que ele importou da, da Holanda e plantou em casa, escondido. Fez um, um guarda-roupa com um, luzes dentro, enfim. E a gente só descobriu que ele estava usando aquilo depois que ele surtou. Né? Aí eu queria que você falasse sobre essa questão da maconha e dos surtos de esquizofrenia, surtos psicóticos. Ele tinha já mais de 20 Um, so it's a very complicated relationship. And because marijuana, like uh, many other substances, does have an impact on brain chemistry and neurological functioning, it is not without risk. Um, for a very small percentage of individuals that have uh, pre predisposed to mental health conditions or early symptoms, any psychotropic medication may make that worse. We see that sometimes when people go to get something for anxiety and they get Xanax or Zoloft and it makes it worse, so they have to try something else. One thing that really makes it complicated is the age. So when we usually see mental health symptoms start to come on, it's the late adolescence. And that's around the same time that people are experimenting with cannabis. So it's hard to know what comes first. So I would say it is very important that we educate people that cannabis is a wonderful medicine with a lot of benefits, but is not without risk. And we need to tell young people that it can be risky. We need to help encourage them to be open and honest about any mental health disturbances they may be experiencing and not just self-medicating with, with a drug, that they actually can get some help. Um, So I think that it's going to be a while before we understand if there's a causal relationship there, which we don't know. Um, so I would say that anything relating to brain chemistry, the way we think, the way we feel, should be taken seriously and that we need to have a better dialogue with young people um, about what the risks are and how to identify when something isn't working. One last thing I will say is that one of the impacts of prohibition has been marijuana that is very high in THC and very low in CBD. This is not because of people who use it. It's because under prohibition, if you're going to go and risk your freedom to buy marijuana, you make sure it's very strong marijuana. You don't want to have to go buy again and again. We saw the same thing with alcohol prohibition in the United States. People were seeking out very high concentrations of alcohol Under alcohol prohibition in the United States, less people died of alcohol overdose, but more people died of adulterated alcohol products. So now that marijuana is moving into a regulated market, we're seeing the THC levels go down. Because the public, when they can go buy it whenever, they don't want something that's so strong. So I think that's something else. The, what you get from the Netherlands is still very much impacted by the prohibition market of the world. So he may have had a hold of something that was very, very high in THC. Uh, without the CBD in there, that is a risk. So with regulation, we people will have access to cannabis that's lower in THC, which I think will reduce the likelihood of having a negative psychological reaction. But I'm very sorry that that happened. It's good to hear that he's feeling better. 
So yes, he's feeling better. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear. Muito obrigado. Agradecemos a Amanda Heyman.